Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is Natalia Pasternak. Dr. Natalia Pasternak, thank you for being here. Thank you, Brian. Natalia's fine. <laughs> I have a brief bio on you, which I will read just to get your credentials out there, and then we'll begin our conversation. Dr. Natalia Pasternak earned a Bachelor of Science in Virology and a PhD and two postdoctoral fellowships in microbiology in the field of bacterial genetics from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is co-author of the book Neuro Mythbusters Volume 2 and author of the book Everyday Science. Dr. Pasternak is also the founder of the initiative Scientists Explain, which offers lectures, classes, and workshops for schools, universities, museums, and research institutes. And she is a founding partner and president of A Question of Science Institute, which is the first Brazilian nonprofit for the promotion of skepticism and rational thinking and publisher of the magazine Question of Science. Thank you very much, Dr. Pasternak, for being here. Thank you, Brian, for having me. And Natalia is just fine. <laughs> Let me ask you a question about yourself, if you don't mind get, being personal. You're in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, the largest state, is that correct? Yes. And so how are you doing? How's it going down there? It's doing pretty well, considering how Brazil is doing in the pandemic. Uh, Sao Paulo, I think, is, is under a very good leadership. So the state governor is very keen into lockdown and social distancing, and he's been uh, uh, he's he's been following the rules uh, of the World Health Organization and keeping social distancing measures and building campaign hospitals. So I think uh, comparing to the rest of Brazil, Sao Paulo is doing fine. There are some other states that are also doing fine, but Brazil as a whole, as you know, is not in the right path. So here in Sao Paulo, it's a little bit better, but not, not as it should. So Brazil is a, it's a nation of states and each state has its own governor for, so every- yeah. Every state's on its own? You're not getting any federal leadership? Or I don't want to talk about this too much, of course, but is that what's... Every state's on its own? You said your governor is very on top of it, so every state is just on their own? How's that working down there? Uh, pretty much like that. Uh, it's a federation, so the, the states have some degree of liberty, and that's probably what's saving us, because the state governors can rule even if they rule against uh, federal government guidelines and the federal government is not giving any guidelines at the moment so yes states are mostly on their own wow and i should preface this conversation it'll be out there for eternity we hope but we are having this on may 12th 2020 in the midst of the coronavirus covid19 pandemic and you are a microbiologist and that's what i wanted to have you on to talk about but before we get there are you working are you in lockdown? What's going on at the university? Because we need the university, correct? The, the university is working. Most of our laboratories are working. And, and of course, they shifted all their research to COVID-19. So my own laboratory is uh, developing uh, four vaccine strategies right now. We are all working with COVID-19, all, uh, all universities and research labs. I am working from home. So I take care of all the, the, the literature review part of the projects, but I'm not in the lab because I have asthma and I am diabetic. So I must be, I'm, I'm staying at home. I'm working from home. So you're doing a lot of reading and evaluation of papers and pre-papers and preprints and... Yeah, that's all up to me so that the, the, the other members of the lab can really get to work on the bench. And it's been really a challenge because there's so, so much going on and so, so much information being put out there in the format of preprints or even articles that haven't really been properly peer reviewed. So it's quite a challenge to, 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 to really separate good science from bad now. All right, let's start at the beginning and be patient with me. You are a microbiologist. What does a microbiologist do? Well, uh, we study microorganisms like bacteria and viruses, 
And uh, I'm actually a bacteriologist. I'm not a virologist. So uh, I spent most of my grad uh, years studying uh, one particular type of bacteria, that's E. coli. And I used it as a model to study genetics. So that's my field, really. I, I work a lot with bacterial genetics. And, and some years from now, five years ago, I started to work also with science communication skepticism so it's I, I have two research lines now not research really but I'm still at the university but I also work a lot with science communication and it's a it's a challenging job really much more so than the lab I'm not a scientist a microbiologist or chemist or anything but I do try to read some of the papers and the abstracts and see what information I can glean out of them and also commentaries such as your own one of the questions I have that I'd like you to explain is, what's the difference between in vitro and what happens in real life? How much can you rely on in vitro going to real life? I recently heard the phrase, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. So what's vitro, in vitro versus in real life? I love that. I would add that uh, mice lie, monkeys exaggerate, and cells don't know what they're doing because in vitro is worlds apart. Really, uh, you're working in, in a very controlled environment in the lab. You're working with, uh, with cell cultures, with cell lineages. Uh, so you're going to test, for instance, uh, a drug you're going to test it in cell cultures. That's even before you're going to test it in mice or monkeys. Uh, so uh, when, uh, when we talk about in vitro, we're talking about the first, the very first step into research, into drug research. It's the, it's the first thing we do in the lab. So we test a lot of drugs. I, I mean, I don't because I never actually did test drugs. I worked with genetics. But w w when we say that scientists test drugs in the lab, that's the, that's the very first step. So they're going to test it in a cell culture. And there are lots, but really, really lots of drugs that work really well in cell cultures because it's a controlled environment. You, you don't have many variables, not many confounding factors there. It's not like you're inside an animal's body with lots of other things going on, what we call confounding factors. So uh, it, it's easy to test in a cell, we have to test it, it's the first step, but it's just the first step. And less than 10% of drugs that do really well in test tubes, in cell cultures, actually make it to animal studies or to human trials. Uh, so uh, we have to really uh, be realistic there, that uh, when we talk about, and we've been hearing a lot of, of news about new drugs being tested, if they are in vitro, it's the first step. We're talking about test tubes. We're talking about cell cultures. That's not much we can infer from that information. We have to wait and see how it develops. You just preempted one of my questions because I was going to ask, what's the scorecard versus in vitro versus in real life? And you just indicated that less than 10% of what works in the lab, do you mean less than 10% for humans? or Less than 10% gets to human trials. Wow, that's incredible. So, yep. so if you and your colleagues read a professional paper for the first time, and it's a success story in the lab, and sometimes that gets reported to the public as well, it'll make it to the public press maybe much too early, um, the next thing we know is that other labs, they're trying to reproduce the results. Why, why is that important that other labs pick up and they try and replicate exactly what the first lab did? Don't you trust each other? Uh, oh, yes, we do. And that's why we want to replicate. Uh, this is what science is about. Science is about uh, replicating and making sure that this is the correct information and challenging that information. Uh, so as scientists, we are very used to being challenged by our peers. Are you sure that, that these are the right controls? Did you do it right? Uh, are you sure that you're testing the right hypothesis? So this is how science advances. Uh, and, and really, it's a privilege when you get your paper, your work reviewed by other, uh, by other scientists, by people who may be much more experienced than you, or that get to see your work in a different way and maybe see something that you missed. 
uh, and it's very important that science is replicated. It's not that easy. Sometimes it works in one lab and it doesn't work in other labs that try to replicate it and we don't know why. But then when we dig further into it and we see well, why, why is it only working here and then sometimes you find you find one thing that that lab is doing differently and that you missed you missed when you published the paper you didn't realize that you were doing something different that you really didn't write it down uh, so it's important that science is replicated and if it isn't it means that you're doing something wrong because if, if people can if people should be able to read your paper and replicate and replicate your experiment exactly as you said you did so if they can't do it something is wrong let's say that you have success in the test tube and then you get to mammals um how much testing is necessary for you to say wow you know i've really got something here i have a scientific conclusion this is a scientific certainty and you open the champagne bottle and celebrate. I mean, how much testing do you go through for that? So, uh, well, when you get a good result in the test tubes and cell cultures, then the next thing you do is test it in mice. And then you have to do uh, a very thorough testing. So you have to get groups of mice and get all your control groups and your placebo groups and, and see what the outcomes, uh, what outcomes you want to measure. For instance, if you're talking about an antiviral as we are uh, searching for one right now. So you have to infect the mice with the virus. You have to know exactly uh, the quantity of virus that you gave to the mice. Then you have to check for viral load every day during a, a certain period of days. Uh, then you see, you divide the mice into control groups. Uh, you see that uh, one, uh, one group gets the medication, the other group gets a placebo, the other group gets nothing. And you compare viral loads and you compare uh, how, they're, uh, how they're responding to the medication in cl uh, clinically. So you're going to see how they're doing. For instance, if it's a respiratory virus, you're going to see symptoms, you're going to check for temperature, for breathing problems, for oxygen. Uh, so you, you have to follow up and see clinical outcomes and, and, and laboratory outcomes. So you're going to check for viral load, for instance, and for some markers in blood. And then after a period, you get to, of course, sacrifice the animals and then you, you check for lung injuries, for instance. So this is what we do in animal models. If everything works really well in mice, then you're going to move to uh, other, uh, other animals. Usually we use, for viral infections, we usually use monkeys. So we call it a, uh, a human non-primate, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the other way around, uh, a primate non-human model. So uh, you, you're going to test with some primates that are not human, but are closely uh, close related to us. And one other thing that's very important is that these, these animals, they are really susceptible to the disease. With COVID-19, we have a real problem with animal models because uh, regular mice are not really susceptible. So we have to work with transgenic mice, with genetically modified mice. And not all primates are susceptible to COVID-19. So we usually work with rhesus monkeys. They are susceptible, but they don't usually develop severe cases of the disease. So we have to, uh, uh, to, uh, to take that into account as well as a result. So it's really it's a challenge. It's not that easy, really, to all the all this. Uh, it's a long way to to check if a medication really works until you can really open the champagne. And and you're still talking in non-human primates. So after you go through all those trials, then you have to set up some trials in human subjects. And can you speak briefly about? Um, randomized controlled trials. I think you wrote about the three arms. So can you just speak briefly about that and inform me? Sure. So uh, when we get to humans, then considering that all, all, all went pretty well in the whole path, you tested in mice, you tested in primates, now it's time to test it in humans. So usually the, the regular, if we weren't in, in the midst of a pandemic, we would divide the human trials in phases. So the first phase would be just to check if our new medication is safe. 
we are not talking about efficacy. We're talking about safety and side effects. So we would we would work with a small group of people and test it just to check for side effects in healthy people, not sick people, just to check for side effects and, and see if it's safe. Once we did that, then it's time to test for efficacy. So we start to work with randomized groups, like you said. Uh, what's randomized? It's making sure that all your groups are similar uh, and have uh, the, the same pattern of people. Uh, so for instance, uh, it wouldn't be a fair comparison if you had one group made of elderly people and one group made of very young and healthy people. It's not a fair comparison. You you must make sure that all your groups are alike. And, and so that's randomization. You're going to uh, put people into groups, one treatment group, one placebo group, and one control group. And you have to do it in a randomized fashion. So these people must be allocated to each group in a way that all the groups look similar in the end. And once you get your randomized groups, then you must make sure at least we try to, it's the, the gold standard would be to double blind the experiment. And that means that uh, neither the doctors or the researchers who are giving up the medication or the patients who are receiving the medication, they must be blinded. They can't know what they're getting, if it's the real medication or if it's the placebo. This is what we call a double blind. And we do it to try to reduce our confirmation bias. Because uh, if the doctor knows what he's giving to the patient, uh, he, 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 uh, he, may, um, he may get a biased, um, assessment of the situation. He may be very involved in the research and he really wants that medication to work. So he may start to see some improvement when actually there is none. It's just wishful thinking really. And the same goes to the patient. He must be, uh, he, he can be very enthusiastic about uh, getting that medication. And if he knows that he's getting the, the medication, he may feel better, but it can all be a placebo effect. So it's important that it's double-blinded. And of course, uh, the people who run the statistics after uh, must also be blinded. They can't know uh, the, the placebo group from the control group or the treatment group because uh, they also are very subject. We all are subject to confirmation biases. So when you do these trials, how many numbers are you looking for to get a good result? You, you need a thousand people in each arm of the trial? You, need, you can do it with 10 people in each arm? You want 10,000 in each arm? How do you uh, get a general statistic? And the other question I have, when you're taking random people, you're not locking them down to keep track of what they're doing. So how do you, how do you account for mitigating circumstances in the causal pathway? Like maybe somebody jogs every day, maybe somebody is a vegetarian or something. So there are two separate questions there. How many numbers and how do you make sure you're controlling the randomization of it? Okay, so uh, usually uh, when we test medications, the uh, the number is important. So the more people you get, uh, the better, really. Uh, but of course, it's not that easy to recruit people to test medications. Uh, I'll what's bet. Hap <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what's happening now during the pandemic is something very frightening because we're, we're getting lots of clinical trials with very few people, sometimes because that's what we get, and, and, and sometimes because the, the, the studies are very badly designed. So usually when you have uh, more than a thousand people, then you, uh, you get a good statistic result. But uh, for vaccine trials, for instance, the, there are vaccines that have been tried in 30,000 people or 70,000 people. And that's important because then you can really check for, for side effects too. Uh, about confounding factors, uh, you asked, it's very difficult to, to check for confounding factors. So we try to keep uh, randomization as clear as possible. But of course, there are, so, uh, there are some uh, very personal conditions that we, can, uh, we won't be able to account for. Usually, when you're testing a, a very specific drug that doesn't interfere as much but when you run trials for uh, uh for uh, for more 
uh, healthy markers like obesity and diabetes and and things that are very related to 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 how people live, to their well-being, then it's very difficult to separate confounding factors from what really works. When, when, when you get lifestyle really mixed into your results. But usually when you test for medication, it's easier because you're talking uh, about people getting a drug and you're going to check for the particular effects of that drug. So for instance, now we, we, get, we get a lot of people infected with the virus, you're going to test an antiviral, it doesn't really make that much of difference if they exercise or not. So COVID-19, it's probably an exaggeration to say that the entire world of science is behind this, you know, the, behind the research and the effort to get it under control, but it's probably not that much of an exaggeration. Will that, with so many people in the scientific community working on this, will that eliminate some of the need for testing? Or are you concerned that things might be moving too quickly? What do you think about that? Uh, on the one hand, I think it's really, it's really, it's beautiful what we've seen, that, that the scientific community uh, has shifted from their own research lines to focus on COVID-19 because it's a global emergency. And so it, uh, I, I'm, very, I'm very happy with all the initiatives that are coming up of people working in medications and vaccines and, and testing. And I think what we're going to get out of this is that uh, technology is evolving very quickly and, and, and it must because we need a vaccine as quick as possible, and we need testing. We need very good testing, and this uh, and the tests that are available right now, the PCR tests, they are very good, they are very sensitive, and they're very effective. But they are difficult to 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 implement, especially in developing countries like Brazil, when we don't. And it's not every city or every state in Brazil that has access to good universities and research laboratories that can really carry out those tests. So, uh, and of course, the, the the reagents for the tests are expensive, and we don't uh, we don't produce them here in Brazil. So we have to import. And, and, and guess what? Nobody's selling right now. Uh, so it puts us in a situation where, where we realize how important it is to be independent in research, in scientific research, how important it is that, it, it, that each country has, uh, uh, has its own laboratories and research facilities and universities that can really carry out research and testing and, di and, and develop new diagnostic tests that are easier and cheaper, because that's what we need right now. So independent, but cooperative, because there's no such thing as um, United States science and Brazilian science, right? It's, it's a big cooperative world when you get into the university system. Yes, perfect. I think that that's exactly as you put it, independent and cooperative. Because, of course, it's a global problem, science is a global language, but we need to be able to, to do science research and, and of course, to, to use technology in our own countries. And this is something that Brazil has really, really missed the, the opportunity in the last three decades. We didn't invest enough in science and now we're paying the price because we, do, we don't have universities and research uh, facilities that can really carry out the amount of testing that we need. We don't have, the, the, we, we don't have enough professionals and, uh, that, that, that are really able to perform these tests. So uh, we put ourselves in a really bad situation. With all the reading that, you, that you're doing, you've been designated as the um, researcher, I guess, on this because of your, uh, the work that you do at the university. Are you reading anything that looks promising? I mean, you don't have to tell me anything specific, but with all of your research, is, are there any things that are popping out at you that look promising? Lots of things. Uh, I think vaccine research is really thriving. People are, are, are moving fast and are, uh, and are developing very good strategies, uh, very, uh, using modern biotechnology so that we can really move faster and have a safe vaccine soon. And I think we will have a vaccine sooner than we expected because the groups are really moving fast. Uh, the, uh, some groups have the advantage that they were already working with some and mayors 
virus and trying to develop a vaccine for these diseases and the viruses are very much alike. So it was easy to adapt some vaccine strategies like the, uh, the Oxford vaccine, the vaccine that's been developed by the Oxford University in the UK. They were working in a vaccine for MERS and, and so it was very easily adapted to COVID-19. And, and this, this is what science is about. I wish that more groups have continued the, uh, to work with SARS and MERS. Many of those research was, uh, of those research were abandoned when those epidemics resolved themselves because of lack of interest really. Uh, it, it really, it, it was out of fashion. There were more uh, urgent matters to attend to. And then you realize that that's not, it's not, uh, there is no such thing as urgent matters in science. All research is important and it should have been continued. Maybe if, they, if we had more groups working with SARS and MERS, now we would already have a vaccine or a drug that would be effective for COVID-19. But still, I think the many groups are moving really fast and doing excellent work in vaccines. With uh, diagnostic tests as well, I have just written an article in Portuguese, unfortunately, or I would send it to you for my own magazine about using CRISPR technology to develop tests for COVID-19. And, and it's a beautiful work. It's just starting. It will take some time until it goes to the market. But I know that the FDA has given an emergency authorization for a small company called Sherlock that developed uh, CRISPR technology-based tests. And it's tests that will be probably cheaper and faster, and that can be adapted to use on point of care. So science is moving fast and people are very dedicated to what they're doing. I think this is the good, the, the good side of the pandemic. You see that people are really involved and committed to producing good science to solve the very specific problems now. You mentioned the SARS-MERS uh, vaccination work at Oxford. That's the Jenner Institute you wrote about earlier? Yeah, okay. that's it. And the reason that lost interest, I think, is because SARS kind of resolved itself. Yeah, the, the main difference be, uh, between SARS-1 and 2, uh, if we're going to talk about the SARS epidemic back in 2002, uh, they are very similar viruses. They are very much alike genetically. But uh, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 is much more adapted to infect upper respiratory tract cells. And, and so uh, it divides really well, it, re it replicates really well in the throat and the upper respiratory tract, while SARS-CoV-1, the old one, uh, replicated well in the lungs, but not so well in the upper tract. Uh, so uh, what makes a CoV-2 much more contagious because it's replicating here. So when we talk, when we sneeze, when we cough, uh, an infected person is full of viruses and it transmits very quickly and very effectively to other people. And SARS-CoV-1 would go straight to the lungs and replicate there. So it was not as contagious. It was easy to, to, to contain when people, and, and the symptoms were much more clear with, uh, with COV-1. So it was very easy to isolate people because people got symptoms from the beginning and they were not as contagious as people with COVID-19. So you isolated and you, uh, it, was e it was much easier to contain, although it was more aggressive. Let's talk a little bit about Brazil specifically. You're in Sao Paulo. You work at the University of Sao Paulo. And I think I read that Sao Paulo is the richest state in Brazil, and most of the science comes out of your university. Most of the uh, GDP comes out of your university. I'm uh, not your university, your state. So how's it going? Have you seen a big influx of funding to work on this? I know you mentioned before that your science funding had been cut, but are you seeing those funds restored? Not really. No? I no, no. Uh, most uh, so uh, some of our funding comes from the state government, and that's okay. The the fund the state funding agencies are really uh, trying to focus on COVID nineteen. So all grant requests to work with COVID nineteen have priority now. Uh, but we also have to rely on our federal funding funding agencies, and these are. Uh, 
very much the same. They didn't really increase funding. They didn't set any kind of particular programs for COVID-19 or emergency funds or anything like that. So it's been very hard on the universities and research facilities here in Brazil. Uh, something uh, new happened. Uh, the universities never really asked for private donations for research. We always relied on public money, on, on, on grants from funding agencies. But now the university has opened an, uh, uh, a very distinct way to fund and it's asking for private donations in the website. So if you go now in my university's website, you'll see something that never happened in the history of, of the University of Sao Paulo. They are asking for donations from private private companies or people that want to give money to science. Well, I find and that I hope they do. <laughs> I find that kind of unbelievable that you you know, my university, I get the alumni letters asking for donations quite at least once a year. So I mean, it's interesting that you've always been able to re rely on state and federal funding and you've never had to create an endowment for the university. That's incredible. We don't have an endowment tradition in Brazil. And, and really, it's not only about tradition, it's very frowned upon. Uh, people don't want money from endowment. They don't want money from, uh, from private corporations. They want science to be public funded. They are very afraid that if you receive money from any private company, they, uh, it, it will really bind you to what they want you to research and it will, uh, it will affect your liberty and your autonomy. And it's nothing like that, of course, but, but it's something cultural in Brazil. When we spoke previously, we talked a lot about pseudoscience, which is a big problem in Brazil, and it's even, in, uh, I guess, invaded the national healthcare system. Have you seen a, f a flight to science during the COVID-19, or is the folk medicine still up and running with cures and quackery? Uh I think people are more interested in real science not right now. They see the danger of the, the pandemic. They want answers from science. So in a way, people are more drawn to science now and scientists have been heard. So we never saw as many scientists in the media here in Brazil. So scientists are being interviewed by national TV news and, and writing articles for uh, for national newspapers. And, and, and this is good. This is something new in Brazil that scientists are, are finally getting their voice out there. But on the other hand, um, folk medicine, I think it's not really a problem right now. But the, the way of thinking that leads people to folk medicine and to, to alternative medicine is the same way of thinking that leads people to believe in bad signs during COVID-19. So if people are not looking for homeopathy to solve COVID-19, they are looking for miraculous solution and miraculous drugs. So uh, Brazil, I think, is the, the, is the country in the world right now that is mostly into chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And, and this is something that for us who work with pseudoscience, it, it, it's so similar. The, the, the arguments that people use uh, to use hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug that has no scientific background to it. So it, 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 has, it has been tested, uh, it, it has been proved to work in vitro, remember in vitro. So hydroxychloroquine has been proved to work in vitro, but never in mice or monkeys or humans. And still people cling to, to hydroxychloroquine and other miraculous drugs as a hope uh, to, to solve the pandemic, to magically solve the pandemic. And this kind of magical thinking is very similar to the magical thinking that we see in, in folk medicine and in pseudoscience and alternative medicine. It's the same arguments. It's the, it's the same lack of criticism and rational thinking. So we recognize it, uh, the skeptic community recognizes this very quickly. When the chloroquine hype began in France with the, with the doctor, uh, the, he's a microbiologist too, Didier Raoult in France, 
it had all the red flags of pseudoscience. So he went to the media before peer review, before publishing the paper. He didn't follow the guidelines of a good clinical trial. He cherry picked participants. He didn't randomize his groups. Uh, so he, he did everything that we see in homeopathy and acupuncture and, or, or, and all alternative medicines. He relied on anecdotal cases. Uh, so uh, he had several patients who said that they felt better or they recovered, but he didn't really measure for viral load and for clinical outcomes and for time of recovery. So it's the same situation all over again. It's the same red flags and still people fall for the same uh, red flags that we spot so easily. So in a way, yes, people are more drawn to science. Well, on the other way, they still can't tell bad science from good. Well, that's a great point, actually, bad science from good, because you just said he's a microbiologist and you had to look at that paper and decide if you're even going to try and replicate but once you find the red flags, I don't know if you say, well, this isn't worth, he didn't follow protocol, so there's no point in even trying this. But as a lay person, a non-scientist, I just see a microbiologist arguing with another microbiologist. So how do I ascertain who's the valid opinion here? I mean, I guess I can do it once I do the research and say, well, what's randomized clinical trial mean? What's she talking about protocols? But a lot of people, I don't know if they'll do that legwork. So we just see two scientists bickering. Is I, You can go with that. I hope I didn't offend you. <laughs> No, of course not. And I think you're bringing a very important point because it's difficult. Of course, I see the red flags, but I was trained to see the red flags and I was trained to evaluate the paper and see if it's been well designed and, and, what, and what they're measuring. But uh, lay people, they, they are not trained to see that and it's not their fault. And, and, I, and I, I agree with you. So mostly what they see is two microbiologists arguing and bickering. And, and of course, if you go into check for Raul's career, he's published much more than I could ever published in my whole life. So maybe he knows better. Uh, I, I'm very junior compared to him. So what do I know? People could, could look at it like that. Uh, and it's difficult. So I think that's when we really need uh, help from the scientific community as a whole. Because if it's just me, or if just uh, uh, a dozen microbiologists saying that that one microbiologist is wrong, why should people listen? But if it's a whole scientific community saying, okay, this is not good science, and, and I'm sorry, he may be a good scientist, but this time he really screwed up. Or have a look at, the, at his career. His career has, something, has very fishy things. Uh, he, he's considered what we call a serial publisher. So he publishes, uh, uh, um, I, I don't remember the exact number, but if you divide it, I, I think it's a media of uh, two or three papers a day. And that's impossible. So of course there's something fishy in there. Uh, so uh, that we, we really need the, the help of the whole scientific community to expose these people, these people that are doing bad science because yes, they are inside the universities and the research institutes and they have credentials. And I should say that lay person is not a pejorative term. It just means somebody that doesn't do what you do. You could be a great mechanic and I'm a lay person or I'm a TV producer and a musician and you're a lay person to that. So it's not a bad word. It just means someone that doesn't have the experience or the knowledge. Exactly. And I, and I can say I, I, I'm a lay person when it comes to a, a, any other field that isn't mine. So I, I don't know the first thing about nuclear physics. Not the first thing? <laughs> no, not really. Oh, okay. I, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> All right. So I read online um, that some poorer sections of Sao Paulo have pooled their resources to hire their own medical care. Is that, why is that necessary in a country with a national health system? Or oh, is that, yes. did I read something incorrectly? Uh, no, you are right. The favelas in Sao Paulo, uh, they Favelas, organize... can you explain that? Favelas? Uh, favelas are squatter settlements okay. uh, of, of people who really don't, um, they build their own homes, but it's not a regular settlement, it's not regular buildings. So uh, it's uh, we have lots of favelas in Sao Paulo and Rio, and it's very difficult uh, 
especially during a pandemic, because these are very dense regions. There are lots of people living closely together, and 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 many people uh, into a uh, into a house that has only one room, for instance. So you have eight people crowding together in a house, in a one-room house, and and the, and the whole area is very densely populated and has no access to clean water or or sewage services. So it's. Uh, it's a mess, really, and and these areas, of course, they are. Uh, these people are entitled to to public health care, but public health care is already overloaded. Uh, so all public hospitals are already full, and and people in favelas are dying at home because they don't have access to to health care or doctors. So some favela leaders, they really organize themselves and and they are providing uh, surveillance and 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 medical uh, medical access to these people. And they hired really they, they hired doctors and, and health professionals to help because they need to uh, to inform those people about social distancing and at the same time these people cannot really do social distancing because they they they, they are in a very dense population crammed together uh, so they need surveillance systems to to check for people who are sick and who may need to get transported to hospital otherwise these people will die at home it, it's difficult they are they are very much on their own so it's a good area for the virus to spread. Yes, yes, it is. And that's what we worried about because the virus is certainly spreading and we are certainly not being notified because Brazil is, has a huge problem of subnotification and picture that inside a favela. Is there any final word of wisdom you'd like to give me? Thank you, Brian, for doing this and for your interest in Brazil. Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think I have any words of wisdom. I, I would just really, I think I can't stress enough the importance of public policies being based on science right now. I think at least if the pandemic is good for anything is to teach us a lesson that we need to base our public policies in solid science and we need investment in science. Otherwise, we won't be ready for the next one. Dr. Natalia Pasternak, thank you very much for being here on 502 Conversations. I greatly appreciate your time. You've been very informative. Thank you, Dr. Natalia Pasternak. Thank you very much.